Hi everybody, it's Little Pepper Lady here. Uh, today is Sunday. It is June 30th, yes, the 30th, 2019. Um, and I wanted to come on today and talk about some recent activities that have been going on um, with Yellowstone specifically. There have been two instances in just the past few weeks um, that have been occurring that are kind of drawing some attention to it again, um, not only for the general public, but for scientists who are studying the activity at Yellowstone as well. Um, and those two instances that I'm talking about have to do with the steamboat geyser. Um, it became active again in April of 2017. Uh, and it has actually been prior to that, you know, 15 years or so since there's been activity out of that. And then just recently um, on the 12th, which was two Wednesdays ago, um, it had erupted. And then again on the 15th, which is unheard of um, for the steamboat geyser. Also along with that, um, over the past few weeks, there were 81 tiny earthquakes that have erupted. Um, now, they didn't register any higher than a two on the Richter scale, but as most anybody who follows any type of earthquake activity will tell you, it's not usually the size of it, um, especially when it has to do with, you know, being in an area where there is, you know, a super volcano like in Yellowstone. Um, it's the frequency of the earthquakes that could cause an issue. So these are things that we need to be paying attention to. And what I'm going to do is kind of go over a little bit of background information as far as Yellowstone is concerned, and then kind of talk about what could potentially happen. Um, so Yellowstone itself is obviously a national park, um, and it includes Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. It was first um, announced as a national park in March uh, on the 1st of 1892 by Ulysses S. Grant. Um, it contains half the world's hydrothermal features, which includes hot springs, mod pots, um, furnerals, travertine terraces, and of course the geysers, which is what everybody likes to go see is the geysers, and not to mention the beautiful colors, which are created by the microorganisms um, that specifically live in that area because they like the heat. Uh, so it, in that area, that's, you know, what attracts all of those people. And on average, uh, especially during the summertime, there's about 11,000 people on average in Yellowstone National Park daily. Um, obviously, that fluctuates depending on the season. But, you know, during this time of the year, it would be close to about 11,000 people in the park. Um, the organisms that do create the beautiful colors, they do have a name. Uh, they're thermophiles, which... I'm really interested in all of that. I learned about all of that kind of stuff back in my biology class a couple of semesters ago. I think those are really cool. Um, and the fact that those organisms are eating certain things, um, you know, that are given off by the geysers, that are given off by the pools, uh, and making those beautiful colors, I think that's amazing. Um, Old Faithful, everybody knows about Old Faithful. That erupts about 17 times a day on average. Um, bisons. That's a huge area for bisons. They have been living in that area of the United States um, since prehistoric times. Now, the first American to ever, you know, travel to and discover Yellowstone was uh, John Coulter, and he was a veteran of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So he goes back a long, long time. Um, when he tried to share his findings and the information that he had discovered uh, when he was viewing Yellowstone, um, obviously way before it was even a national park at that point in time, um, he had tried to tell people about all of the eruptions and things that were going on there, and people kind of thought he was crazy, so they actually at that time nicknamed uh, Yellowstone Coulter's Hell. So let's kind of get into the eruption portion of Yellowstone. It has erupted three times. Um, the first time occurred 2.1 million years ago, um, and when it erupted, it covered 5,790 square miles with ash. 
So if you're thinking about it, it's not quite in the central United States, but it's pretty close. So if you're thinking about that type of an eruption occurring again, imagine the entire United States, part of Canada, part of Mexico, covered in ash. That would be what you would be thinking of. Um, it's crazy when you think about it. Um, after that first eruption, another one occurred about 1.3 million years ago. And then the third one occurred just 600 and I believe 40,000 years ago. So what scientists have discovered is Yellowstone erupts. Now, not quite on the same scale as the first eruption. The other two eruptions were a little bit smaller, um, but it does erupt roughly between every 660 to 800,000 years. So let's just sit back and think about that. It's decreasing in time every time it erupts. The first time was 2.1 million. The second time was 1.3. The third time was 640,000. So if it's decreasing in time and it's already been 600 and some odd thousand years since it erupted, is it due to erupt again? Quite possibly. Was there a lot of um, swarms right before it erupted? Yes. Now, that's not saying that it's going to erupt. I'm not saying that by any means. Um, but I think it's something that we all need to be paying attention to. Because like I said, if it does erupt, it's going to have a major impact on not only the people in the immediate area, but all over the country as well. Because when something like that occurs, not only is it going to um, disrupt you know, all of the wildlife, make things inhabitable, decrease uh, oxygen supply, cover you know, all of those thousands of square miles in ash, it's going to block out the sun. Um, we could have a nuclear winter. We could not have breathable air. Everybody would have to be underground. And those that don't have access to be underground, um, they basically would be eliminated, unfortunately. You're not going to be able to breathe that air um, for quite some time, you know, after it's done erupting. And it could erupt for months or years. It just depends on how much magma and pressure is underneath there um, when it does, you know, decide to go which none of us can predict it. None of us have control over that. It's the earth and it's going to do what it's going to do. It's just something that we need to be aware of. Is there any way that we can protect ourselves and our children and our grandchildren from it? I'm not sure. Um, you know, having some place underground, having gas masks, having that kind of thing, it's probably a good idea. That's something that I would be prepared for. I mean, I have my basement and it, like I said, it has the one window. If I could find a way that I can seal proof that window and uh, seal proof the walls and the doors and have gas masks and be able to have a way to cook and eat and go to the bathroom and things like that down there, that would be my best bet. Is that why there's all these trainings um, that are going on underground? Uh, we know about a lot of, you know, if people are following Marfugel um, and John X Army and those kind of channels. Um, they do talk about a lot of underground training that's going on. Um, you know, they're buying a lot of gas masks um, for the military, for the armed forces. And is this something that they're preparing for? Quite possibly. Is the recent activity that's going on there something that everybody's looking at? Yeah. Um, so these are things that we need to kind of... Keep our head on the swivel. Be paying attention to it. There are some things that, um, you know, the scientists say are good key signs to pay attention to um, if it could potentially erupt. So localized earthquakes that are going towards a center position. Now, I saw the map of the earthquakes, the 81 earthquakes that have happened over the past couple of weeks, um, and they're all kind of like in this general kind of, you know, shape. Um, are they going more towards this? Maybe. Are there going to be more that are going on this side? And then that will make a general area? Quite possibly. And that would be something that we would need to pay attention to. Also, you will start seeing um, the rocks start to shift inward. Um, anytime there's going to be a buildup of pressure, it's going to go down and then it will go out. Um, that's just how it works every time with a volcano. 
That's why, you know, the center of a volcano goes in like this. So that's something that we need to be paying attention to as well. If we start seeing the, ro the rocks shifting at Yellowstone, then that's something that um, should put us on high alert as far as that goes. Um, just to give you a little bit better perspective of it, according to the United States Geological Survey Association that does monitor all of the activity that goes on at Yellowstone, um, they are saying if it were to erupt, 87,000 people would die instantly and two thirds of the United States would be uninhabitable. Um, like I said, it would block out the sun. It would create food shortages. We would be in a nuclear winter. The air wouldn't be breathable. Um, could it affect, you know, all the way on the other side of the world? Yes, once that spews out into the atmosphere um, and the biosphere and it travels around, it would alternate the weather patterns. It would completely change the course of the world as we know it. Um, so would it have an absolutely devastating impact? Yes. Would it be cataclysmic? I don't know. It depends on how large the eruption ends up being. Um, so I'm a little nervous about it. I'm going to keep my eye on it. I'm going to see what happens with it and see, you know, if the earthquakes continue, if uh, the geysers continue to erupt sporadically which has been unknown over the past 15 years. I'm just going to be keeping a close eye on that kind of thing um, and try to be as best prepared as I possibly can and keep my family as best prepared as we possibly can. So I want to hear your guys' feedback on this. Um, you know, this is a huge deal. It's going to affect a lot of people if it does end up going. And those scientists don't know any more than we know. They might have a little bit more information, but if something's going to go, it's going to go, whether it's going to give us you know, any type of a forewarning or not, it's just going to go. Um, that's how the earth works and we're kind of at the mercy of it. And let's think about this too, uh, one real quick thing before I get off here. What are we doing to the atmosphere? What are we doing to our water? What are we doing to our soil? Could all of those types of things that we are putting, pumping, polluting into this earth have an impact on what's going to happen with Yellowstone? I think so. Do I know that for a fact? No, but if you're screwing with different things in the atmosphere, you're screwing with the water supply, you're screwing with the animals, you're screwing with the soil, it's going to have an impact. Um, so those are other things that we need to be paying attention to uh, in you know, trying to do better for not only our future, but our kids' future and our grandkids' future and the future of this planet, because this is where we live and we need to take care of it as best that we can. Um, that's all I've got for you guys today. As always, always remember everything does happen for a reason, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, you're in a good situation or a bad situation, just stick with it. You're on that journey for a reason. Everything's going to be okay. Also, always remember, forget about the past. There isn't anything that we can do about the past other than grow and learn and try to be better people while we're staying focused on the future. But we need to be living, be loving, and be laughing our lives away right now because tomorrow's not guaranteed. We all could not be here tomorrow. So it's important that we're staying focused on the future while we're living our lives right now. That's all I've got for you guys today, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.